TSOS has been knocking it out of the park with their 1911A1 clone since about 2020, 2021 is when I think they started getting really popular. And this is the one I bought back in 2022. I actually made a video where I compared some of its features and markings against an original. I really, really like this pistol. The build quality is outstanding. It's a fantastic handgun. But it's always had a few anachronisms that I never really cared for. Um, like the color wasn't just right. Uh, it's Cerakoted, obviously. The markings on the slide I never really liked. The ejection port is lower than it would be on an original M1911A1, and it uses the early style Colt hammer, and those parts are metal injection molded. Well, TSOS has actually gone one step further with their line of clone 1911A1s and rectified basically most of my complaints. So in mid-2023, TSOS released a new line of clone 1911A1s, and the biggest selling point was the fact that they're actually parkerized. But in my opinion, the thing that excites me the most about these guns is the fact that they fixed the ejection port. So if you don't know what I'm talking about if you look at an original 1911A1. This is a Remington Rand with a Colt slide. If you look at the height of the ejection port, you'll see it's actually higher than a lot of commercial 1911A1 clones. This is the 2022 TSOS, and you can see that the ejection port on the original is a lot higher. And if you look on the new 2023 TSOS, you'll see that they're pretty much the same height, which is fantastic because for whatever reason, it's really hard to find guns that have this high cut ejection port. And I think the only other companies out there that come to mind that are doing it are Inland and Auto Ordnance. The third thing that really excites me about this gun, besides the parkerizing and the ejection port, is the fact that they removed the stupid markings on the slide. So if you didn't know, the old TSOS 1911A1 clones had this anachronistic model M1911A1 US Army marking on the slide on the left hand side. And to my knowledge, there was never a real 1911A1 marked that way. And it just doesn't look right, doesn't pass the 20 foot test, and it's always going to look like a reproduction so long as that uh, so long as that marking is where it is. So, so I think them removing that completely is actually a huge plus. I would rather have no markings at all than an incorrect marking there. Anyways, in short, this is pretty much my favorite reproduction M1911A1 clone on the market. And surprisingly, they're probably the best repro 1911A1 clone on the market right now. Anyways, I was so impressed with this handgun that I actually went and bought another one in 9mm so I can shoot a GI1911 when I'm out of 45. Inside the box, you're going to get a cleaning brush, a patch jag, two magazines, a trigger lock, a bushing wrench, a chamber flag, and an extra set of grips. Speaking of the grips that come in the box, these are TSOS's attempt at reproducing the plastic GI grips for the 1911A1. And you can just very clearly see that they're not the same color as the originals. But more important than that, they don't feel like the originals. The originals have actually a pretty aggressive texture to them and they do a good job of gripping your hand. These are really, really slick and the diamonds have almost no texture to them. It's just all rounded over. If your hands were even a little bit sweaty, I'm sure these things would be super slick. So in my opinion, these are pretty much good as junk. I think TSOS knows that no one likes these and the first thing they do is take them off, but they probably have like a big surplus of them so they're just including them in the box because now the gun itself is shipped with these wood grips on them and um, these are really well checkered they do a great job of gripping your hand not only that but for whatever reason they used a really nice piece of turkish walnut on on this one in particular my biggest complaint with these grips is that they're the stupid double diamond pattern. I don't like them. Uh, they just don't look right on a military handgun. And I know that the original 1911s from 1911 had those double diamond grips, but no other 1911 from the 1911A1 upgrade program in the 1920s onward until like the 90s, early 2000s had those. If you bought a Colt government model from any time between the, the late 20s all the way probably into the 90s, it would come with fully checkered wood grips and maybe they'd have a Colt medallion in the center, but they'd be fully checkered. So the weird thing is TSOS actually does sell fully checkered wood grips. So I wish they would just sell these guns with the fully checkered wood grips that they already make. Funnily enough, we talked about how poorly these plastic grips that TSOS made uh, actually match up to the originals. Um, these wood grips from TSOS that are fully checkered look surprisingly close to original 1911A1 grips. So yeah, in my opinion, they need to ditch the double diamonds and start selling them with fully checkered wood grips because these just look way nicer. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and swap them out right now. That's way better in my opinion, and I think this is how the gun should ship. Now, the next thing I want to talk about are the markings, actually. And I, I mentioned that I liked the fact that there were no markings on the slide. Well, they've also gone and put like a United States property marking and uh, M1911A1 US Army where it should be. But they also changed the location of the serial number. And the serial number is now on the left-hand side of the frame, which 
Uh, in my opinion, I think that's kind of a step in the wrong direction. If you look at an original 1911 A1, on the left-hand side of the frame, there are basically no markings besides the proof markings and inspection stamps, which I understand why they wouldn't recreate that. Uh, that's kind of going above and beyond, in my opinion. So when I look at these new t sauces from like the 20-foot test, I can see, you know, I can very clearly see that there's engraving there on the left-hand side of the frame. And even though I don't know what it is, it just doesn't look right to me. Um, whereas I don't really care about like the U.S. property marking or it's saying M1911A1 U.S. Army. The 2022 version actually has better markings on the frame in my opinion. You've got the manufacturer, importer, and then the serial number where the United States property marking and the serial number would be on the originals. So when you look at this, this passes the 20-foot test, this passes the 20-foot test. I think what they should have done is kept the markings from the 2022 frame and then also maybe put M1911A1 US Army after the slide stop pin, but I'm not a fan of them moving the serial number to the left-hand side of the dust cover here. Uh, it just doesn't look right. So A plus on the slide, uh, B minus on the frame. One more word on markings. They do still have the Zig 1911 Turkey marking on the bottom of the dust cover out of the way, and it's actually a lot smaller than the 2022 version. Another change they made from the 2022 version that I am a fan of is they went away from this early style Colt hammer with the big spur and they went to a more common style, uh, I think it's a type E hammer or fifth type hammer, fifth change hammer. Um, that's a little bit more common, a little bit slimmer. And as you can see, all of the original ones I have here, um, they all have that slimmer hammer. So that's a good change in my opinion. Now, oddly enough, they did not change the front sight post from the 2022 version. It's still the terrible, terrible round front sight post that uh, everyone very quickly got rid of in the early 20th century. I wish they would have gone to the uh, ramped and serrated front sight. It'd be more usable in my opinion. So on the 2022 version, TSOS was still using metal injection molding or MIM for all of their small parts. Um, I believe the slide and the frame were forged, but most of the small parts were MIM. Now, one of the things that really annoyed me about this gun is that you could clearly see see the sprues on the hammer where they cut the sprues. People have all kinds of opinions between MIM and forged parts. Um, forged parts just instinctively I'm going to believe are going to be stronger parts than MIM. Forgings actually press the metal into the rough shape of the part before it's machined to final dimension and that gives the grain structure a little bit more strength because it's actually formed in the shape of the part already, whereas metal injection molding is similar to casting as a, a very coarse grain structure. Now, whether or not that really makes a real difference, um, you'd have to fire a lot of rounds, I'm pretty sure, to see any sort of difference between MIM and forged parts and, and testing them to the failure point of their strength. So for me personally, I just don't like the way it looks. I don't like the way the sprues look. From a reproduction standpoint, the original 1911s, all the small parts were forged. That was the USGI spec. So TSOS moving to machining all their small parts from billets and forgings, in my opinion, is a, is a plus. Let's go ahead and get into the actual mechanical overview of these guns. So I'm gonna start off with the parkerization. Um, the parkerization on these new guns are beautiful. It's extremely even. There's no tool marks under it at all. It means they did a really good job machining and finishing these parts. And uh, the, color, the color matches really nicely with the darker manganese phosphate parkerization. Now, uh, if you watch my short, you'll know that the uh, original 1911A1s, a lot of them had this darker section towards the muzzle. Now, obviously, TSOS did not go out of their way to recreate that, but the parkerization on this gun is, is almost a dead ringer for the parkerization on the real guns because they're using real parkerization now, not Cerakote that's approximated uh, to look like parkerization. And one of my biggest complaints about the 2022 version, and a lot of people I, I've spoken to uh, have echoed this, is the fact that the color is just too light and too green. It just doesn't look right. It doesn't look like any 1911s I've seen. It definitely doesn't look like any of the ones I own. Now, while on the subject of finish, parkerization is not a super corrosion resistant finish. It's also not super common. So I wanna take a moment to talk about caring for a parkerized finish. Now, the thing with parkerized guns, especially if it's a gun that's used a lot, carried a lot, um, or just has a lot of opportunities for that oil to get displaced, you have to constantly replenish and retreat it with CLP. Now, even for the guns I don't shoot very often and they're just up on the rack, um, I have to constantly redo this oiling ritual because CLP does have a tendency to evaporate pretty quickly. And once that CLP evaporates and you're not on top of it, those guns can start to rust pretty quickly. And that's why a lot of these military arsenals wouldn't use oil for long-term storage. They'd use grease, they would use cosmoline, sometimes even Vaseline um, to store these guns for long-terms because they don't evaporate the way oil does. 
But for most of us, we're not packing our guns away for 20 years in a crate somewhere, you know what I mean? That brings me on the topic of our first channel sponsor, a company called Lube Nano Arms Chemistry. Now, the reason why they, they contacted me is because they saw me using their products in an earlier video and they were like, hey, we have this new product, would you like to try it out? And essentially it's a corrosion inhibitor called Gold Guard. And the way it works is you wipe it on wet and then it dries to essentially like a Cosmoline-like finish. Um, it's a lot easier to apply and it's also a lot easier to remove than Cosmoline. So anyway, I spoke to the owner of the company and he talked my ear off for about two or three hours. Um, he's kind of like a mad scientist, he's a German guy and um, he's really super into his product. He sent me a ton of stuff to do some tests for him. Um, the first one is an outdoor exposure test. The second one is a salt spray test. I've been running the outdoor exposure test for about two months now, and uh, the Gold Guard is doing extremely well. Now I'm gonna make a full video where I explain the methodology and stuff, but on the left-hand side, I've, I've gone ahead and wiped CLP on a piece of steel. On the right-hand side, I put a product called Ezox, which is similar to Gold Guard, where the instructions are to wipe it on, let it dry, and then it resists corrosion from then on. And then Gold Guard's in the middle, where I wiped it on, let it dry, and then it dried to that, that Cosmoline-like waxy film. And uh, if you look, the Cosmoline and the Ezox have yielded to the elements um, within a month. And this was all the way through that like mid-January freeze, too, here in Texas. Um, a lot of rain and stuff like that. And the Gold Guard has shown basically one tiny little spot of rust in the center of the plate and a little bit on the upper right edge, but that might be my fault for not applying the Gold Guard super evenly, and maybe it's kind of creeping around from the back side of the plate, because the back side of the plate that was left untreated is like really, really rusting. So yeah, this stuff works pretty well. I've been using it on all my guns at this point, and uh, it's given me a lot of peace of mind. I'm sleeping better. I used to get this nightmare where my guns were rusting about four or five times a month, and now that I've been using Gold Guard, it's only like once or twice. So if you're interested, go ahead and check them out in the description or up here somewhere or, um, yeah. Anyway, back to the mechanical overview. Now, as we've come to expect from TSOS, the machining on this pistol is fantastic. There are no visible tool marks anywhere on this pistol. And the slide to frame fitment on all three, including the 2022, uh, the new 45 and the nine millimeter um, are all excellent, especially at the rear. The rear is where it moves less than the up front and the slide to frame fitment on all three are fantastic. A lot better than pretty much any of the GI 1911s you're gonna find out there. Some people think there should be zero movement in the slide and that if you have any movement, you have an inaccurate gun. And uh, that's really not true. Most of the accuracy on a 1911 derives from the barrel fitment and the bushing fitment. So while we're talking about barrel fitment, the way you wanna check that is by putting your thumb over the barrel in the breech and press down as hard as you can. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna check between the barrel and the bushing and the bushing and the slide. On the new 45, up front we have basically zero play, which is great. And at the breech, we have just a barely perceivable amount of play when I press down. And when you press down, I mean, your, your thumb should be going white. On the nine millimeter, however, I'm not super impressed. There's maybe half a millimeter of play up at the front. And it's, I can't tell if that's between the bushing and the barrel or the bushing and the slide. I think it's between the bushing and the slide. Um, on the barrel, however, there's probably, oh man, quite a bit of play. I mean, I can, I can actually see that there's a lot of play on this nine millimeter. So we'll talk about that later. And on the 2022 version, the barrel has no play at all at the breech and no play at all at the muzzle, absolutely not. Yeah, the 2022 version definitely wins as far as the uh, barrel fitment, but you know, they shit out so many of those. Um, you might get one that's more tight than the 2022 version, and you might have one from 2022 that's sloppier than, than the one I've got that's new, so. So the triggers on all these TSOS 1911s are actually pretty good. So to start as a baseline, the 2022 version has a really nice crisp trigger that's probably about four and a half pounds. The new 45 has just as crisp of a trigger, and I'd say it's maybe a little bit heavier, maybe five pounds, but it also hasn't been shot as much, so maybe it hasn't broken in yet. Uh, the nine millimeter, the trigger does have some noticeable amount of creep, but it really shouldn't make any difference if you're pulling your trigger right. It's a roll trigger by that standard. Um, weight is about the same, four and a half, five pounds, no problem. TZOS always does a really good job with grip safety engagement. On the 2022 version, it's literally like 20 to 30% of the travel of the grip safety to deactivate it. 
On the new 45, it's maybe about 40 to 50% to deactivate it. And on the nine millimeter, it's probably like 20%, 20 to 30% again. What you don't want is a grip safety that you need to depress like 80, 90% to deactivate. Cause then if, if you grip it weird or you draw it or something and, and it comes up and it's not all the way pressed down, then obviously your gun's not gonna fire. So TSOS does a really good job. All of these are like under half of the travel of the grip safety to deactivate them, which is uh, where I like them anyway. So one thing on the 2022 version, uh, if you press down on the safety after it's already in the fire position, it'll click into like a lower spot and then click back up. Uh, I don't think that really affects anything. It's just kind of annoying, I guess. On the new 45, there's a lot less down travel on that safety and it does not do that click. So that's good. On the nine millimeter, it does have that sloppy safety and does click when you push it down on it. And that's not unique to these TSOS 1911s. Um, original ones also have this problem. And, and this one on the Ithaca, you can actually push it down and it doesn't click back up on its own. So that's all well and good, but let's talk about performance. Um, I put about 100 rounds through the 45 on the first day, um, on the first range session. And I was using, in my opinion, some of the shittiest ammo I've ever used. It's called Scorpion Ammo. I would not recommend it. This stuff was so inconsistent. I mean, I could feel it from shot to shot. It was spitting back in my face. And I tried to test it for accuracy. On a B8 bullseye, on a 25 yard target, I was off paper for a lot of those shots. So it was just super inconsistent. Now, the second time I took it out, I was going mainly for accuracy because I couldn't get any real accuracy results uh, with that shitty ammo. And I used uh, Winchester USA Ready. It's select grade ammo. It's, it's pretty good ammo. And I was able to put some pretty decent groups down in my opinion. Anyways, at 25 yards, I put 15 shots on paper. So I did a full magazine with a plus one and then a full magazine. So I think my first group was three and a quarter inches and my second group was three and three quarter inches. I did have two flyers out here. I mean, you could count those. That's 13 rounds all here within like three and a half, three and three quarter inches. So I'm pretty happy with that. If you take that group and you superimpose it over the bullseye, uh, you can tell that this gun could easily hold the inside of the nine ring, which is good. Now, I did try to test this gun out at 50 yards and I was not really able to put down anything resembling a group. The limiting factor on these GI style 1911s are always going to be the terrible sights. And TSOS decided to use the worst sights, um, the round half moon shape. You know, every manufacturer around this time period kind of figured out that these half moon sights suck for precision shooting. And they all went to like ramped and serrated sights. You can even see that on like Smith & Wesson and Colt revolvers. You see that with the GI 1911s, like I was talking about, these all have ramped and serrated front sights. They're way easier to see because they have a defined top edge. The problem with the round GI sights is that there is no defined top edge for your eye to focus on. And depending on the lighting conditions, the entire top of the front sight can be you know, lit up and you won't have anything to freaking focus on. You know, you'll be focusing on a portion that you think is the top of the front sight, but it's actually a lot lower than the front sight post because the light is reflecting off the top of it. So yeah, I really wish TSOS had gone to the ramp and serrated front sights. It would have been a lot better than, than these, but I'm gonna be replacing these sights anyway, so more on that later. And of course, don't let my poor shooting suggest that this is an inaccurate pistol. I'm sure if you put this in a machine rest, that three and a half inch group or that three and a half inch average would shrink down to probably like a two and a half inch average. Oh, as a side note, I'm pretty sure these GI sided 1911s are designed to be shot with a six o'clock hold on a larger military bullseye target than these B8s and B6s. So that's kind of why all my shots were hitting a little high. Anyways, yeah, I'm sure the 45 is more accurate than I am. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and continue with my plans for this pistol. Now, the 9mm, on the other hand, was a little disappointing. Now, for one, these magazines were ridiculously difficult to load. The first ammo I tried was Max Tech 124 grain, and I don't think I could get more than like five or six rounds in the magazine before it was completely impossible to load. This is my first group with the 9mm, and honestly, I wasn't super impressed with it. Um, so I, try, I started off with a center hold, and all my shots hit so high that uh, half of them are off the paper, so I, I just didn't even count those. I just marked them. Um, and then the second group I shot, I shot with a six o'clock hold. I fired a full magazine of nine millimeter at a six o'clock hold and I ended up with a five inch group. 
Anyways, yeah, I was not impressed with the accuracy of that first group. And uh, what I think is going on with the 9mm is that barrel fitment is coming back to haunt me. Like I said, there is visual amounts of play in the breech here. Uh, there is visual amounts of play here in the muzzle. And those are probably the two most critical areas when it comes to accuracy of a 1911. And you know what? As a whole, when I was shooting this gun and it was cycling, it just felt kind of loose and a little bit rattlier. When you shake this one, there is a little bit of a, of a rattle that you can hear. It's just, it's not as tightly built or as well fitted as the 45. I'm gonna shoot it a little bit more. If I can't squeeze a three and a half inch group out of it, you know, I'm gonna to have to fit a new barrel and a new bushing, or maybe I just get in contact with TSOS and see what they can do about it, because um, that's unacceptable accuracy. And you might say, oh, what if, what if it was the ammo? Is the ammo trash? You know, I've never heard of Max Tech before, but you know, I took that, ma that same Max Tech ammo that printed this group here, and then I shot it out of a P210-6, and I produced a group that's about like an inch and a half with one flyer. So it's not the ammo, because uh, you can see right here, this ammo can actually shoot. And I've shot quite a bit of it. It's, it's pretty decent ammo. Anyways, I shot it again with a different type of ammo, 115 grain mag tech, and uh, that was a little bit easier to load. Maybe if you're gonna shoot this, stick with 115 grain. Maybe the longer 124 grain bullets don't play well with the magazines or something. And again, when I shot this, they started with a center hold and half my shots were off the paper. So I was like, okay, I'll do a six o'clock hold again. And even with a six o'clock hold, it was hitting extremely high. And I measured out the total group size to be four and three quarter inches with uh, mag tech 115 grain ammo. A little better. Again, I'm gonna have to shoot it more to see where the accuracy is really at. Um, and before anyone says the ammo, again, I took that same ammo and I ran it through a P210-6 and I printed a group like that. That's smaller than the 10 ring. So this is just a full magazine. I think it's eight shots from a P210 magazine. Again, just not seeing that accuracy with the nine millimeter that I wanna see. Just as like a control, I went and shot the 2022 on the same day with the same conditions with the same ammo. And I printed a group that was very similar to the group we saw with the new 45. This is a little better, three and five eighths inches. I think this was three and three quarters and three and a quarter. So pretty much about the same. If you subtract the worst shot from this, you're looking at a two and three quarter inch group, which is more than enough to hold the 10 ring at 25 yards. And you know, I did mention that the barrel fitment on this 2022 is, is really immaculate. I think what I might do is actually swap the barrel and bushing from the 2022 into the 2024. And the reason why I wanna do that is I wanna take these guns and I wanna convert them into old school bullseye, uh, national match style guns from like the 60s. And I've got the like an old school sight set from Ken Sight and I wanna stipple the front, you know, with the hammer punches and stuff like that. So I really want an accurate 45. If I get an accurate nine millimeter, that'd be cool too. Um, but I already have an accurate nine millimeter. This would just be more for fun. So far, I'm pretty happy with the, with the accuracy from the 45. So uh, definitely a proceed on my plans. And one last thing that I guess falls under performance, um, we're gonna talk about the parkerizing again. Parkerizing is not a very durable finish like we discussed, and um, it does scratch extremely easily. So despite this 2024 gun having only been to the range uh, twice, it has more scratches on it than my 2022 gun, which has gone to the range several times. It's been in and out of holsters and stuff like that. So. I don't know if they're gonna to continue to sell the Cerakoted version into the future, but just know that the Parkerized version is probably gonna wear a little faster um, than the Cerakoted version. It's probably not gonna be as corrosion resistant. But you know what? I think it's gonna look really cool. It's gonna start developing some really cool wear patterns and really start looking like the old ones. You know. Anyways, in conclusion, the TSOS Arm Service family Parkerized 1911A1 clones are probably the best readily available GI 1911 style clones on the market right now. And I use that term readily available because Colt did make a series of uh, reissues, I think they called them, that used like all the proper roll stampings and they even put like the proof marks and stuff like that on there. And, you know, those are probably the best reproductions on the market, but they're not readily available. I think they were a limited run. They only made like 4,000 of them. And if you find one now, I think they're probably, you know, well over a grand uh, for them, at which point you might as well just buy a real one. T sauces, on the other hand, are readily available from, from pretty much anywhere. Um, they can be ordered, they're in current production, and they make a ton of these, and they're extremely affordable. So if you ever had a hankering to get a GI style 1911, and all the ones around you you see at gun shows are all rip-offs, and they're trying to sell you one for like two and a half grand or something stupid, go and get you one of these, man. These are fantastic. In fact, these are actually such good reproductions that TSOS is partnering up with the CMP, or the Civilian Marksmanship Program, to sell these 1911s, 
And uh, if you want one and you want to support the Civilian Marksmanship Program, then that would also be a good option. So if you don't know what the CMP is, that stands for Civilian Marksmanship Program. And they're essentially the premier organization in the United States for the promotion of marksmanship, both pistol and rifle. They mainly host and certify and authorize matches that are ISSF, slash Olympic style rifle and pistol events. But as of recent years, they've also been hosting the Bianchi Cup, which is an action pistol competition. And let me tell you, CMP matches are probably the most fun that you can have sober and with your clothes on. So if you've never heard of them, I recommend you go and check them out. And if you get one of these T-Sauce 1911s, I think you have an excellent pistol to begin competing. One competition in particular, that's the as issued 1911 match, where you're only allowed to use 1911s that are in typical military configuration with fixed sights. And uh, considering that these guns are, are better built than the originals, right? These originals are 80 years old and you know, they're not hardened all the way through. And, you know, they're kind of sloppy at this point. They're not as accurate. Maybe the barrels are shot out. These are probably the best way to get into that match. And another thing too about these pistols is I think the machine work and the tolerances and the quality of the parts on these pistols are so high quality that this makes a great platform to start like custom gunsmithing on. Also, I should probably point this out because I feel like I'm, I'm gushing over these pistols and, and you know what? My next review is also gonna be a TSOS pistol. I don't want anyone to get the idea that I'm like sponsored by TSOS or anything. I think these guns are just really, really awesome. They're, they're amazing quality. You know, I used to not like 1911s until I bought one, this one in particular. This was my first 1911, Remington Rand. And once I shot it, I was like, I wanna shoot this more, but I don't wanna wear out my World War II 1911. And then, you know, that was around the time that T-Sauce was becoming really popular. And that's when I picked this one up. And let me tell you, I really love this pistol. I would not have any, I would not have as much interest in 1911s as I do if T-Sauce wasn't able to provide these amazing, I mean, they're like cult quality 1911s for a third of the price or a quarter of the price sometimes even. So. Um, the fact that they're providing so many high quality guns at such a low price, it's just fantastic. It's also kind of dangerous though, because then you get into this habit where, let's see, I have one, two, three, four, five, six guns from T-Sauce at this point. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of addictive. Um, Oh, anyways, it's been a long time since I've done a full length video just because it takes so much effort to do this and, you know, and so much time commitment. Um, I just haven't had the time. I have a regular job now that's nine to five, um, you know, where I'm not going out into Alaska and fishing for months anymore. So um, hopefully I can bring more regular content to you. Hopefully you guys have noticed an uptick in my shorts content and uh, hopefully you guys look forward to my next review. Thank you.